Are you preparing a video? Yep. Excellent. My arms will be fixed soon. No, that's going to be a restoration. This is going to be a feature project. No, I am your project. Not today. But you said... Later. I'm not pointing fingers, I just... <laughs> yeah, I can see that. We gotta get back to... There are a lot of things in our lives that we want and at the same time don't want, and both cases usually have lots of reasons. In the past few years, Star Wars collectors have increasingly clamored for a group of action figures now famously named The Last Seventeen. They were the last hurrah of Kenner Star Wars in 1985, and the prices continue to rise. To hear most collectors tell the tale, the last 17 are the pinnacle of Kenner Star Wars, far superior to the more prolific toys and characters in the line that we spent our days playing with in the backyard. But are those last 17 really stratospherically greater than the 79 figures that came before them? Star Wars collectors on various forums told me that if Retroblasting ever does a video that even remotely criticizes the last 17, they'll get angry. It's a rare courtesy to be told ahead of time that an angry mob will come after you should you embark on a specific task. Knowing that, I knew I couldn't safely assume anyone shares my observations about the last 17. So on this journey, I've decided to enlist two Kenner Star Wars experts and get their opinions as well on these allegedly magnificent 17. Tom Burgess, the founder of IGrewUpStarWars.com, and Jake Stevens, founder of FromForlomToZuckus.com, sat down with Retroblasting for an interview about The Last 17. I didn't share my own thoughts with them ahead of the interview, and I had no idea what their takes were either. All of us, while different ages in 1985, were pretty much in the same mental place. Star Wars was long over, and by the time Kenner's Power of the Force line hit the shelves, we had all moved on to other things. Never recall seeing these on the shelves or paying attention, most likely. Uh, I remember more vividly uh, Trilogos on clearance at KB's. So this line didn't get by me. I'm going to have to go with the same thing that uh, Jake here said. Um, I uh, really don't barely remember these at the store. I walked by them quite a few times. I do specifically remember the uh, Luke in uh, Stormtrooper, and uh, I think that's about it. Did I collect them? I did not, because I was about, uh, I was 14 years old and slowly, no, not slowly, quickly getting out of the Star Wars franchise back then. Return of the Jedi was re-released in theaters in 1985, ahead of the VHS home video launch in 1986. Kenner used the opportunity to redesign the packaging for the Star Wars toys as an all-inclusive line called Star Wars Power of the Force. Previously, Kenner had simply changed the packaging logo to reflect the latest film, but kept every action figure in circulation. Yes, all of them. From 1978 to 1984, Kenner never dropped a figure from the line. They dropped vehicles and playsets, 
but not action figures. But when Power of the Force launched in 1985, we saw major figures disappear for the first time. Relatively few older figures were given the new packaging. Kenner had intended to reintroduce all of the figures on the new packaging, but it wasn't meant to be, due in large part to Star Wars' waning popularity against other toy lines. But I also believe that some of the decisions Kenner made regarding the last 17 didn't entice children to collect them. Instead of giving us figures with more advanced articulation like their G.I. Joe contemporaries, Kenner instead gave us collector coins with each figure. What good is that to a kid? Kenner was literally trying to distract us with shiny objects instead of delivering a solid assortment of toys. The only use I found for them was to practice my Two-Face impression. Heads I win, tails you lose, Batman. Ten-year-old Jake had no use for the coins. Threw them in my Jedi tin, did not see them again or care about them probably until high school. So These had coins? These had coins. I probably would have tried to like stuff these in a Pac-Man machine. Despite the new all-inclusive logo that isn't movie specific, there are only two figures from The Last 17 that aren't from Return of the Jedi. One is the Imperial Gunner, who manned the Death Star weapons controls in both the original film and in Return of the Jedi. Despite some claims that he's specific to one of the films due to his lack of chest armor, photo evidence shows that in both films there are gunners without armor, so take your pick. The Imperial Gunner is probably the best figure in the entire Power of the Force line, because he's a new Imperial soldier that you could get multiples of to bolster your enemy forces. Unfortunately, he was packed with that terrible indoor Leia blaster, despite photo evidence that he may have originally been intended to carry the Imperial Blaster. The second non-Return of the Jedi figure is Luke Skywalker in Stormtrooper disguise. This figure could have been really cool. He had that removable helmet, he was a legitimate variation on Luke that had a lot of play value, and he could serve double duty as a standard Stormtrooper. You put the helmet on. Yeah, and that's what... like any other dude. That's how I played with my Luke. He was an extra Stormtrooper. Never have too many of those. But his head is horrible. He looks like one of the ghoulies. That little pea-headed little freak. It didn't help matters that there was no Han Solo in Stormtrooper disguise to complete the duo. A Han would have been great. That would have been a great bookend of two figures. Luke and Han in Stormtrooper outfits? Heck yes. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. And before you argue that Carbonite Han Solo could be from Empire Strikes Back, remember, his action figure is in the wrinkled, filthy, post-Carbonite shirt. I bought this figure in 1985, and I liked it a lot because of the Carbonite block that came with it. But even I could see Han's head was a necklace mess, and he didn't come with any weapons, which was disappointing. There had been a Carbonite block previously released with the Slave 1 vehicle, but it was undersized, so the Carbonite block that came with Carbonite Han was a great upgrade. Now, what about the other 14? Well, one thing that I can say is it ain't a and and it ain't the Empire Strikes Back lineup. I mean, what have you got? We've got some holdovers that would have made great figures five years before in the line, and uh, some throwaway characters that had about two seconds of uh, airplay, so. Yeah, they're all from Return of the Jedi, and they're not even filler. They're the filler between the filler. First off is Barada, who's another staff-wielding skiff guard with a leathery lizard face. How many of these figures did we need? Kenner already served up Weeque, Nikto, and two Klaatus. Barada is the action figure equivalent of white noise. And what is up with his outfit? He's wearing a puffy pirate shirt and a bright yellow vest. He looks nothing like the other skiff guards. He's the most fabulous guy in Jabba's palace. He's Barada. We were also given a mana man, a frog-like alien guy. While I could do without the tree branch accessory, I'll give this one points for sheer scale. I would have had fun with this monster during playtime. It's a good choice. EV-99 was a droid entry in the run, the head of Jabba's torture chamber, and makes a good companion figure to 8D8. But the action figure was rickety and brittle. Don't move the arms or they'll break off. Don't drop it or the arms will break off. And good luck getting it to stand up. Then we've got Yak Face. Seriously? His name is a slang term for vomit. He doesn't even look like an actual yak. Waldo is in Return of the Jedi longer than he is. Not even Kenner could justify this one, so they shipped him off 
to Europe. And now he's one of the most highly priced characters in the line. That, my friends, is a new level of insanity. Let's talk about the A-Wing pilot instead. He was a great figure. Or was it actually a she? Yeah, one of the A-Wing pilots was a female actress, and they dubbed a male voice over her. Fail! So does that make the A-Wing pilot the only other female figure in the Kenner Star Wars line besides Leia? Regardless, the A-Wing pilot figure is the perfect match to the B-Wing pilot the previous year, and a good rebel troop figure. Yeah, he-she came with a dinky indoor blaster, but it didn't matter because he-she flew the A-Wing. There was just one problem. The A-Wing wasn't sold in the power of the Force line. They shuffed it off with the droids' toys. Fail! One figure that certainly wasn't a fail was Lando Calrissian in his Superfly General's attire. Complete with lavender cape and blaster, Lando was a great substitute for Han Solo if you wanted the Falcon to have an alternate pilot for the day. I'm just not sure why they packed him with the Jabba's Palace blaster. Then we have Endor Luke, the second figure I purchased from the Power of the Force line, and the last Star Wars figure I ever bought as a child. This figure is 20 levels of letdown. At a glance, you think he'll be pretty cool with his poncho and his removable helmet. That's until you realize the helmet isn't removable. Why? Endor Leia's helmet? Removable. On Endor, Leia's card photo shows she's wearing her helmet. On Luke's card back photo, his helmet is off, which makes it even more infuriating. Endor Leia even had a functional holster for her blaster, assuming you didn't lose it. Endor Luke's non-removable helmet means all of the great sculpting underneath the poncho of his Death Star dual outfit is wasted. He could have been two figure versions in one, just like Endor Leia. Instead, he looks goofy as all get out, and he's packed with the Jabba's Palace Blaster. What is up with Kenner's obsession with the Palace Blaster towards the end of the run? This accessory is guilty of two crimes. One, it doesn't fit in Luke's holster, nullifying the cool factor there, and secondly, it isn't a lightsaber. After the one attempt at Jabba's Palace, Luke doesn't use a blaster for the rest of Return of the Jedi. Who was running the Star Wars division at Kenner in 1985? Did all of their best minds move on to mask or something? These are the kinds of decisions an out-of-touch soccer mom would make. You have four figures that don't even have accessories. No guns, no blasters, no sticks, no swords, no anything. Playability is a bit lacking. These next four, I'm just lumping them together because there's no point in dragging you through this otherwise. The Power of the Force line dumped four more Ewoks on us. Who else do we have? A bunch of Ewoks. They're cute. We already had Chirpa, Logre, Wicket, and Tebow. Now we get Paplu, Lumat, Warrock, and Ramba. The first four Ewoks were spread out over a two-year period. Chirpa and Logre in 83, and Wicket and Tebow in 84. In 1985, Kenner doubled down our Ewok options without the courtesy of consulting us first. Had they done so, they might have learned that the first four Ewoks were more than adequate. But there was an Ewoks cartoon out in 1985, so we suffered on all fronts. Four good figure slots that could have been used for Han Solo and Stormtrooper disguise, a new version of Princess Leia, or Wedge, or Dak. Nope. Bears. I'm still waiting for the memo to come out from George Lucas to Kenner requesting more Ewoks, because this line is Ewok heavy. You'll hear a lot of people argue that Lumat and Paplu aren't part of the Power of the Force line, because they were briefly available on Return of the Jedi cardbacks in 1984. However, the last time I checked, no one was referring to it as the last 15. The line consists of 17 now, but actually it's really only 15 because Paplu and Luma are posers. They were actually out limitedly on Return of the Jedi card. Wow. I yes. don't even know what you said, but... Next up, we have Anakin Skywalker. Not a Darth Vader with a removable helmet, just robed, ghosty Anakin Skywalker. Kenner offered him as a mail-away in 1984. I sent away for him, and never received him. In 1985, they pushed him out on a card back. He's a robed old man who doesn't come with any accessories and couldn't hold them even if he did. This is the definition of a mail-away freebie if I ever saw one. However, now that George Lucas has erased Sebastian Shaw's performance in the film 
and replaced it with Hayden Christensen, this action figure is now a symbol of a purity with Star Wars that's long been lost. He's his own deleted scene. Which brings us to the single greatest travesty in the entire history of the Kenner Star Wars line. There's no justification that anyone can give me for this entry that's an acceptable rationale. Imperial Dignitary where Anakin Skywalker was once Darth Vader and Luke's father, which allows his figure to slide under the door of inanity just before it slams, Imperial Dignitary does not have the same shielding. This is an action figure of an old wraith of a man in a purple dress and a miter, with no accessories and no hands to hold any. Where is he in Return of the Jedi? Blink and you'll miss him for sure. No lines, no consequence, just a member of the Emperor's faceless entourage. Would it have killed them to make Moff Jer Jared or Admiral Piet or Grand Moff Tarkin from the first movie? Tarkin would have been a great figure. Old well, guy, though. Well, I mean, this, this, this wave was not without its old guys. Right? My Chuck E. Cheese birthday party would not want an old man. I mean, might as well throw another <laughs> May Dean at me, right? No, those are not the fun figures. I'm willing to admit a man a man was cool looking that Imperial Gunner and A-Wing Pilot were solid, and even that Han Solo Carbonite and Luke Stormtrooper were well-intentioned figures, but nothing on nothing will convince me Imperial Dignitary was a good figure. This is a soccer mom decision if there ever was one. The kid who really dug this figure probably displayed him between his Rock Collection and his Rock Lords Collection. I guarantee you 9 out of every 10 kids that received this figure got it from a clueless relative, and there was weeping every single time. Oh, there was weeping. You can bet all those poor kids were begging for Ewoks over Imperial Dignitary. The amount of plastic wasted on this figure should be considered a federal crime, and don't sit there and tell me how nice you think the sculpting is versus earlier figures, or what a leap forward this was for Kenner. A leap forward would have been knees and elbows that could bend for all of these figures. G.I. Joe is running circles around Star Wars by this point, and in the midst of all that, with Star Wars figures now far behind G.I. Joe in terms of features, Kenner rubber stamps Imperial Dignitary for production? My first love is and forever will be Kenner Star Wars. But I'm not going to live in denial. Imperial Dignitary is a mistake from every angle. It isn't a good business decision, and it certainly isn't in keeping with kids' play preferences. Kenner didn't make Moff Tarkin in the original line because they didn't think kids wanted to play with an old man, especially an old man without any action scenes who died at the end. But they're willing to make a character without any lines or accessories who wears a dress and has three seconds of screen time? And if the fact that Tarkin died was their rationale for not making him, that doesn't hold any water. Kenner's Star Wars is full of dead people. R5-D4 <laughs> Walrus Man <laughs> Greedo <laughs> Obi-Wan <laughs> Wee Quay <laughs> Klaatu, Barada, Nikto, Jabba, The Emperor, all of these guys, and Imperial Dignitary? I hope the designers at Kenner who approved Imperial Dignitary really enjoyed the obvious binge drinking they did the night they greenlit this joke. And I hope they're still feeling the effects of the hangover. You know, there's nothing really new about this line other than the coins because they've already had removable helmets started in the Jedi line. Yep. They had cloth capes already in the Jedi line. Not too much new introduced here other than a coin. That was the uh, that was a sales pitch right there. The coin, I think. Not getting anything else. These figures aren't groundbreaking in any way. In some ways, they're a step backward. Yes, they're certainly fewer in number production-wise than the rest of the characters, but there's probably more of these still mint on cards than all the rest, because so many ended up in clearance bins across the country or exiled to Europe. So why do collectors want them so badly? I think the fact that no one was picking these up makes these carded figures more abundant than the other ones, um, which makes sense. If there's no interest, you're going to have backlog you're gonna have back stock um this stuff is gonna be around um this stuff is gonna be around when uh things start getting hot again so these guys were just 
waiting on the corner, ready to be picked up. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking with the end of most lines, they cut back production because, of course, the the demand is not there. So I do think there probably is a little more rarity built into these, but I don't think that's what makes these extra hot. I think what makes these extra hot is the fact that a lot of collectors, like myself, who was deep into the other lines, did not pick these up. And so this is now a chance to go back and, you know, relive some childhood nostalgia by picking up something that was out when I was young, but I never had it, so I can experience the getting it for the first time, like I did with many of the other figures that came along. So I believe it's probably a combination of the two. Whatever your adult rationale, if you're buying these as I did, you're getting them most likely because of that magic Kenner Star Wars still has over us, and the memory of any of those figures we saw that we never had, whether they were from the first assortment or the last. They certainly aren't my favorite figures, but I remember them being there, being a part of the original Star Wars experience, and for that, I can't completely discount them even as I call out some of Kenner's wacky decisions. The words, collect them all, still resonate in my mind, because that was always the dream as a kid, to eventually have them all, even if you weren't actively interested in every single figure. By now you're probably saying, you've only talked about 16 figures. What about the 17th one? Despite my strong fandom for vintage Star Wars, I'd never worked at completing the figure collection. For many years, I just had my childhood characters worn and missing their weapons. I collected more sporadically throughout the late 80s and early 1990s at comic shops and flea markets, but I was never out to get them all. Instead, I seemed to focus intensely on the toys from The Empire Strikes Back, finding a few choice variants and upgrading the figures I already had. Even after I was done with that in 2008, Star Wars always had that power to call me back, whether it was for more accessories or a new figure here and there from the other two films. If you're a completist, you're going to get these. It's it's you have no choice. And that's the great thing about the vintage collection. You only have a limited amount and that's it. People are going to pursue these figures because like me, who was really into it, the first three lines was now distracted with other brands to collect. Uh, it's a way to recapture what I had with the first three lines today by finding those figures I didn't have from my youth. It always felt wrong not to have a complete collection of Kenner Star Wars figures because that first Chewbacca is what started my interest in toys. Kenner Star Wars indirectly created retroblasting. So of the 15 final figures I didn't already have, I tracked down 14 of them. But finding that last figure means an almost lifelong journey, 32 years in the making, ends. More than a year ago, this parcel arrived on my doorstep. Inside is the 17th and last figure, R2-D2 with pop-up lightsaber. At least, I hope it is in there. I couldn't bring myself to open it when it arrived. I saw this figure on the pegs as a kid, but I chose Indoor Luke instead. While I would have liked a new lightsaber accessory, I didn't want another R2-D2, and I hated the card art, which shows R2-D2 being blown up at the Indoor Bunker. It didn't make sense. I also wasn't thrilled by the way the lightsaber was always sticking out of his head and didn't really launch so much as rose up like a car antenna. As an adult, I do have a greater appreciation for this figure. While I will never regret not having those Ewoks or Barada or Imperial Dignitary as a kid, I do wish I'd grabbed this R2-D2 when I was seven. Now, as an adult, this R2-D2 is the finish line. Part of me really wishes Imperial Dignitary was in this box, because then I could easily leave it sealed for all time and have the best of all outcomes. No, it's time.
Now this line was great because it not only featured Camel Toe. I don't want to turn this into a retro blasting commercial, but I mean, come on. Tails, you lose, Batman. <laughs> You had four Return figures. Return of the Jedi was just a terrible, terrible movie, wasn't it? For toys? <laughs> Awful. Well, you have Awful. four. And this is a Star Wars guy Tell <laughs> These are Star Wars guys, and we are totally crapping on Return of the Jedi figures.